Are there going to be two interpreters during the meeting today? Now that I'm not sure of. Okay, thank, no, I, I see in the chat that there will not be, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So far, all of our attendees are English speaking. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to uh, Community Collaborative. I'm Perry Clausen, Executive Director of Valley Water, and we'll be going over our management zone draft plan that was posted here last week. And we look forward to answering any questions you might have. Before we get started, I wanna have an explanation of our translation function and also some information about Zoom etiquette. So next, Lydia, I'll let you take over. Oh no, I guess our translator, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Muy buenas tardes a todos. El día de hoy esta junta va a ser transmitida de manera simultánea. Si usted necesita acceso de lenguaje, si tenemos interpretación disponible, para accesar la interpretación solamente va a hacer clic en el icono que parece un mundo. Después de que seleccione el icono, va a seleccionar su lenguaje de preferencia. En este caso sería español y de esa manera usted va a poder escucharnos. Para que no escuche el eco de inglés, puede poner en silencio el audio original y de esa manera solamente va a escuchar la presentación en español. Puede hacer comentarios y preguntas en su lenguaje y nosotros lo traduciremos. For anyone who is monolingual English speaker only, if we do have any comments in Spanish and you would like to listen to the interpretation, all you would have to do is select the interpretation icon, then select English and you will hear the simultaneous interpretation going on live. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now Lydia will talk about the Zoom etiquette for our meeting. Thank you, Perry. Hi, everybody. So just a couple of things I'd like to cover here. Um, first of all, you are all attendees to the webinar, um, but you should be able to see your name as a participant. If you do not have your first and last name identified on the participant list, um, please send me a chat or email me to let me know what your first and last name is and, and I can go ahead and, and update that for you. Um, as an attendee in the in the webinar, you are um, automatically muted, although I have given all the participants the opportunity to speak during the Q&A. If you have a question during the Q&A time, you can click on the Q&A icon and type your question into that function, um, or you can raise your hand and we will uh, direct you to unmute yourself and ask your question. If you're having any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat function, or you can reach out to me at the email address above and either I or one of the other um, hosts will help you as best we can. Thank you so much. Okay, we had somebody just join us that if you're interested in translation into Spanish, uh, follow the interpretation icon at the lower right. So we'll go ahead and get started. If, uh, next slide, we'll talk about what the meeting's gonna cover today. I'm gonna give you an introduction on who and what Valley Water Collaborative is, the purpose of the meeting today, and then really go into some detail, but not a lot on the nitrate control program, and especially what are these management zones, and importantly, how you can participate in uh, commenting on our draft plan that was just recently posted. And then also we've got some maps and a new an interactive map that enables you to plug in addresses and search your location to see if it might be in an area that's been indicated as having high nitrates. And then we're gonna talk about our, our drinking water solutions and what's gonna be included in the early action plan. And then finally, how to connect with the management zones. So next slide. So who is the Valley Water Collaborative? So we were formed last August as a nonprofit organization 
that was established to manage the management zones in the Modesto and Turlock basins. And our goal is to work with others in this area to uh, improve nitrate water quality in our aquifers for the current and in the future. And then we want to work with the local communities and others and you on the call too, to ensure that drink, uh, safe drinking water is available as soon as possible. We'll talk about those timelines in a minute, but we're, we're, we're pushing for an all hands on deck in these local areas to get assistance in getting the word out about this program. And the mission of us as a, our organization as a nonprofit is to implement these programs that, that provide safe access or access to safe drinking water for residents and then protect and enhance the quality of drinking water used in this basin. So as we in the next slide, you'll see that as a nonprofit organization, uh, we were established with a structure that is intended to provide economies and scale to the fairly extensive activities that we have to do over time. Because Modesto, Turlock, and Merced, which is a priority basin, priority two basin, that will be uh, included in the collaborative in about a year, these are all parallel or adjacent basins. And we we figure that as far as a business management of these implementation activities, we try to realize any economies of scale that we can. So that is a, a, a big goal to try to do things as efficiently as we can. We have a board of directors and then in the implementation side in each of these basins or sub basins, we'll have a committee that will provide direction to the board on budgets, on getting input on these plans that are being developed. And then as the outreach rolls out to help facilitate the connection with the various groups and populations in these areas. And the committees are open for anyone, environmental justice, local entities, uh, certainly stakeholders and, and permit holders will all be participating in, in these committees as these plans are developed. So on the next slide, you'll see our website. We have, uh, you have the ability to join any of our email lists. We have both a stakeholder list and a community participation list. So you can join both or either if you wanna be notified on these and future meetings. And also as many of you that are on this saw, we released the, the, uh, the draft plan and just let you all know that that plan would, was available for comment. We'll continue to do that in the future for any of these deliverables and pro, um, plans that are going to be developed over time. So the purpose of the today's meeting that uh, is described on the next slide, and you can see the um, give you an update on the status of these management zone plans. Uh, we've identified uh, a little bit more close detail the areas with the unsafe nitrate levels, and then we're working to develop these long, these short and long-term solutions to provide safe drinking water. And there are, as I mentioned, we have a plan that's available for comment on and We wanna encourage folks to read those, give us comments. Uh, there's a, a pretty easy to read survey at the end if you, didn't, uh, if you didn't wanna write long elaborate comments, but we welcome any length of comment on these plans. And I'll show you this website several times throughout the presentation, but that is where you go to find the plan, uh, download the, the documents in both English and Spanish. So in the next slide, I wanted to start into this description of what is the nitrate control program? And even more specifically, why does nitrate even matter in drinking water? And then what are we supposed to do in the management zone? And what does it do? What is our goals? And then how can you participate? So in the next slide, we'll talk about the fact that the nitrate control program is a regulatory program. It was adopted by the Regional Water Board with three primary goals. Uh, primary being provide drinking water with safe levels of nitrate to reduce nitrate impacts to water supplies. That's working with those in the industries that have nitrate as an input, agriculture, dairies, uh, city wastewater treatment plants and other types of facilities. So we want to reduce any impacts that may be currently happening. And then in the long term, figure out a way to restore these groundwater aquifers where they have been impacted by nitrate, where it's reasonable, feasible and practical. 
So when this program was developed, uh, the Water Col Valley Water Collaborative established these two management zones uh, to implement these programs. So again, here's uh, with more information on the nitrate control program, you'll see the link here at the bottom. Again, we'll show that later in the presentation. So the next step is uh, to describe this area. So the, the regulation, uh, go to the next slide, it is led by dischargers uh, who are permitted under the regional board and they had an option to comply with this regulation either individually or to join a management zone. And again, the goal is to try to make sure residents have safe drinking water and these dischargers uh, are employers of many people in these regions. Uh, agriculture, dairies, poultry, wineries, food processors, the city wastewater treatment plants and others. So we're again wanting to reach out to work with employees and others in these areas and citizens to figure out what are going to be the, uh, the local appropriate nitrate solutions. So what, what the next slide we're going to talk about, what does nitrate matter to me? So a very fundamental policy that was adopted by the state of California and the legislature was this, what's called the California Human Right to Water. This policy has a very clear statement that is in statute now that overrides and it's uh, included in every regulation that's related to water quality. And you can read it here. Every human being has a right to safe, clean, affordable, and accessible water adequate for human consumption, cooking, and sanitary purposes. So the way we measure impacts of nitrates is levels in, in milligrams per liter. The standard currently is 10 milligrams per liter. The levels under 10 are considered safe to consume. Nitrate is not one of those uh, constituents where you, you can't taste it. Some people have told me, well, my water tastes terrible. It must be that nitrate. Well, that may be a, a metal of some sort or other kinds of, uh, other kinds of constituents in the water because nitrate is not um, oh, taste, you can't taste it and you can't smell it either. The other important point is if you do have nitrates, you can't boil your water to get rid of it. There are some constituents that you can do bacteria such that you boil the water, it will get rid of it, but not the case with nitrate. In fact, it, it condenses it in that water. And then where the, the health risks are is that there's cer certain populations, very young infants and older people where it can, where high nitrate can reduce your their blood's ability to absorb uh, oxygen. So the next slide, what, what's important to understand for everyone in the community is where am I getting my water supply? When I turn the faucet on, where does that water come from? Many people are located in a public water system for instance, any of the cities, major cities, and even medium-sized to small cities have a public water system. And their information is available on this website. But also there's an obligation of these public water systems to provide you in your water bill, either quarterly, semi-annually, or annually, a report on what they find in that water. Not the case with a private domestic well. You, as a as an owner of that well or, or, or a leasee or renter of a house, have the responsibility to get that well tested to know whether there is nitrates in that well at safe levels. So the next slide. So I want to uh, turn this over to Richard Meyerhoff, who's going to talk about the management zone and what what can be what is involved in the in the development of these zones and the plans that we're developing. So Richard. All right. Thank you, Perry. So I'm just gonna briefly kind of pick up on what Perry has done so far in laying the foundation as to why we're here, what are the regulations driving this discussion, uh, what, what's it, what, what are we talking about when we talk about forming a management zone. So as he's indicated, the, the process has been to develop a proposal, to develop a, a Modesto management zone and a Turlock management zone. And ultimately these management zones wanna work with you, the community, to help you determine if your drinking water has safe levels of nitrate. If not, provide an alternative for you through the program so that you have another way to get safe water uh, and then work with you over the long term. This is not a short term program. This, in fact, is a multi year, uh, decadal type program where we'll work with you over the long term to implement permanent drinking water solutions uh, for these two areas, the Modesto and Turlock management zones. 
There'll be many ways to be involved, but the three key ones are just now, for example, participating in a meeting like this, and there will be many more meetings like this as the program is implemented. More about that later. Uh, we will be working with you to, to get your input on drinking water solutions. As we'll talk about an early action plan in a few minutes. We have come up with a proposal of how we uh, think that program should be rolled out, but we want your input on that. And then ultimately, as Perry has already indicated, there's opportunity to sign up at the Valley Water Collaborative website to stay informed. And then you obviously will get the notices and you can choose to participate as you see fit. Next slide, please. So how can you, what can you do right now other than sit on a Zoom call and listen to a presentation? Uh, as we've indicated, there is currently what is called a preliminary management zone proposal available for public review. PMZP is the acronym, you'll, you'll see that occasionally, but we're talking about the foundational document that's been put together to propose that these become management zones for the purposes of implementing the nitrate control program that was just described. Did a brief five short bullets of what's in that proposal. It talks about the process to establish it, the background, why are we doing this? It characterizes the management zone, tells you about the area that you're living in, tells you about the water quality. The bottom right figure there, for example, we'll talk more about that figure here in a few minutes, uh, gives an indication of where we have nitrate concerns in your groundwater. Uh, it identifies who's participating, what dischargers are working collectively together to help uh, resolve any issues in the area. And then very importantly, we'll spend some time on this today, it summarizes what the early actions will be through the early action plan uh, to address nitrate impacts to drinking water. So there's that major document, the foundational document available for public review, and associated with that is another document called the Early Action Plan. And this actually details the program to be rolled out as soon as May of this year. Uh, next slide. So the Early Act, the, all these documents, we're back to a, a screenshot of the website, valleywaterc.org. Uh, if you'll go to the main page in the upper right, there is a word that says plan. Click on that and it'll open up a page as you see in the left where there's a number of files that are available for download. The, there's a lot of dot, uh, bullets there. The top one is the actual proposal to establish the management zones. So it's one document that talks about that issue for both Modesto and Turlock management zones. And then we have a number of choices for you to review, depending on how much detail you want to get into. There is an early action plan, that's the EAP, that is for the Modesto Management Zone. There is a uh, corollary or similar document that's been prepared specific to the Turlock Management Zone. And it, it has its own early action plan. Within those, we've broken the document up, again, depending on how much depth you want to get into. There's a main document, there are appendices if you wish to look at those. But very importantly, we have executive summaries for both the Modesto and the Turlock early action plans in English and Spanish. Uh, and if you just have a little bit of time to review and want to catch the highlights, it's about four pages long with some figures. Uh, we encourage you to take a look at that. It's something you can easily share around to get other people's input. Uh, we would appreciate you doing that. Next slide. All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll come back at the end of the presentation to remind you again of how you can uh, provide comment in the next uh, couple of weeks. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Barb Dogish with Ludorf Scalmanini, uh, consulting engineers, who's going to talk about the water quality uh, issues in the area. Thanks, Richard. Um, so I'm a hydrogeologist, as Richard mentioned, and I have been doing a lot of work on the water quality side of these regulatory requirements for the nitrate control program in the Modesto and Turlock management zones. So I'll be talking today about all of the different methods we use to start identifying areas most likely impacted by elevated nitrate levels in groundwater. Then I'll talk about where nitrate occurs within the Modesto and Turlock management zones. And I'll show you an interactive map feature that I made that can help you zoom into your neighborhood and see where you are within the management zone and what the estimated nitrate might be in domestic wells near you. Um, lastly, I'll discuss some statistics regarding the number of domestic wells and estimated population that might be affected by elevated nitrate levels. Um, so let's jump in. Next slide, please. 
So first things first, um, in order to determine nitrate conditions in our area, um, I did a massive data search. So I collected all available groundwater nitrate data from all of the public sources, such as state and federal databases, and that includes tapping into and querying data from sources including GeoTracker Gamma, the Department of Water Resources, Department of Pesticide Regulation, the Division of Drinking Water, State Water Board Regulated Facilities, Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program, Monitoring Data, UC Davis Nitrate Data, and the US Geological Surveys um, database as well. Um, in addition to these publicly available data sources, we also sent out data requests for any wells with nitrate sample records from the county departments of environmental or public health, as well as local irrigation districts and water districts. All of this nitrate sample data was compiled into a massive nitrate data set specific to the Modesto and Turlock subbasins to be used for a spatial analysis. Um, next slide, please. So now that we have a large set of nitrate data from all different sources for wells all over the two subbasins and including the edges of the subbasins, I needed to categorize these wells and their nitrate data into depth zones. So the nitrate control program is focused on what's called the upper zone of groundwater. This is a previously defined term that was developed to indicate the portion of the groundwater system that most domestic wells are completed in. So when you drill a domestic well, they typically don't drill them as far down underground as you would for, say, a larger municipal supply well or even a high capacity agricultural well. Um, those wells are typically drilled to deeper depths, and so nitrate levels from those wells might be very different than nitrate levels in a domestic well located in the same area. A simplified cross-section is shown on the right side of the slide that illustrates the various zones of the groundwater system in our area. So this cross-section is kind of like if you pretended the earth was a, a cake and you sliced the cake down the middle and looked at the side of a slice of cake. So you can see the land surface on top where houses would be. And then you can see there's a dry soil zone, the upper brown layer of cake directly underneath the land surface. And then as you go down, you hit groundwater. So the depth to groundwater varies, but here it's shown as a thin blue line under what we call the Vado zone, which is just a, a geologic term for um, the soil zone above groundwater. Um, you can see in this slice of cake that the upper zone of groundwater lies above a large clay body that is found at depth that can act as a type of barrier to water migrating downward. Um, this is called the Corcoran clay and almost all domestic wells are completed above this layer in the Modesto and Turlock area. The nitrate control program again is focused on this upper zone because it is designed to help solve nitrate issues in local residents drinking water. So the main goal that I had was to figure out how to use the nitrate information I had gathered and categorize each nitrate sample data into a depth zone. I was able to associate groundwater nitrate data into the correct depth zone, mainly using well type and well depth if available. Um, <clears throat> so I could use uh, well completion report statistics and well types to make those estimations and, and put each of those nitrate samples into the correct depth zone. But unfortunately, um, not all nitrate groundwater data has that type of um, detail associated with it. So lots of nitrate sample data were not included in our nitrate conditions analysis. Um, next slide, please. So once we have the groundwater nitrate data categorized by depth, we can look at the distribution and availability of nitrate data across the management zones, specifically for the upper zone, again, the zone that most domestic wells tap into. Since we know that nitrate conditions can change over time and we are most interested in recent conditions, we limited the nitrate data to samples taken since the year 2010, so basically the last 10 years. Taking an average uh, nitrate value for each well since 2010, we can see what the average nitrate concentrations look like in the upper zone. So the map on the right hand side of this slide shows all of the nitrate groundwater data that occurs in the upper zone since the year 2010. Each colored dot represents a well with a certain average nitrate concentration. Wells that have low nitrate concentrations are shown in green and yellow dots. The orange and red dots or wells on the map have higher average nitrate concentrations since 2010. This map alone is really helpful to get a sense of where high nitrate concentrations can be found in the zone that domestic wells get water from. 
but it also has a lot of spaces where we don't know what the nitrate concentration is. So to figure out what ambient nitrate conditions are in as much of the two management zones as we can, we use a tool called spatial interpolation. This is a geostatistical technique that basically uses information about what we know to fill in the blanks in areas we don't know. So next slide, please. So using that interpolation technique and the meticulous vetting that we did to make sure that the recent nitrate data came from a well in that upper zone, we can really see a better picture of ambient nitrate conditions in that upper zone across the two management zones. The colorful dots from the last slide are seen again in this slide because these were our control points. The shaded colorful areas from green to red represent different levels of recent ambient nitrate. Green to yellow indicate low nitrate levels <clears throat> and safe nitrate levels for drinking water. Orange areas indicate elevated nitrate conditions, but still under the safe drinking water limit. And the red areas, however, indicate areas that have potentially impacted levels of nitrate higher than the safe drinking water limit. So in this map, green is good and red is bad for nitrate. Um, you can see many pockets of high nitrate occurring throughout the central and western areas of both management zones. Um, the blank spots that don't have a nitrate shading color are what we call data gaps or areas where the nitrate level is unknown because we didn't have any data in those areas. Um, luckily, these are small areas found mostly in the eastern margins of both subbasins. Next slide, please. So you may be looking at these maps and thinking to yourself, where am I in these management zones? What are the nitrate conditions in my neighborhood? Do I even rely on a domestic well or do I get my water from somewhere else? Well, to help you figure that out, I made an interactive map that you can access online. Um, this interactive map allows you to type in your address, as Perry mentioned, and it will zoom to your street. You will be able to see the colorful shading that represents ambient nitrate in the upper zone since 2010 and see if the water pumped by domestic wells in your area are potentially unsafe to drink. That would be those red areas if you remember on the map. So um, if you'd like to participate in this live demonstration that I'll give in a minute, um, please type your address or an address that you're interested in in the chat box and I can pull it up for you on the map. Um, I do have to remind you though that um, this is merely a tool to help us identify areas where domestic wells might be impacted by high nitrate levels, but we encourage you to have your well tested to make sure that not only is it safe for nitrate, but any other constituents of concern. Um, next slide, please. So um, this slide is just a little overview of what I'm about to demonstrate in the live demo. Um, there's a place on the top of the screen where you can type your street address. Plus there's a plus and minus icon that allows you to zoom in or out. Um, and there's also um, some black diagonal hatched line areas that represent boundaries of public water systems. So if you pay a water bill to somebody, you are probably located within a public water system boundary and might not rely on your own private domestic well. Um, in this map, you can click on the public water system layer to find out what it is, what its name is. Um, so in this example on the screen here, um, <clears throat> it's the city of Waterford that I clicked on. So um, the legend will remind, and oh, also the legend on the map will remind you of what the nitrate levels are. So I'm gonna go ahead and try and share my screen and give you a demonstration. I, I appreciate you guys putting your addresses in. So we'll. Pull them up right now. Okay, so this is when you pull up that link, this is what it'll look like. Again, the shading of the red to green um, indicates the nitrate levels since 2010 in that upper zone that we talked about, which is typically where domestic wells are drawn from. Um, the legend will also show you the black hatched areas, which you could see the city of Modesto pretty big, the city of Turlock. These are those public water um, systems that, that are required to um, let you know if something is wrong with their water or if they're out of compliance for whatever reason. Um, so, and if you click on them, it pulls that information up. So you could, you could say, okay, City of Modesto, I could go Google that and make sure that that water that they are providing to me is safe. Um, and then if you're interested in specifically your Modesto or Turlock management zone, this map will tell you which one you're in. So I'm going to go ahead and copy one of the addresses from the 
chat. And then up on the top right, we're going to paste that address and zoom right to it. OK, so this location is outside of a public drinking water system. And it's also in a red area, which indicates that it might have potentially elevated nitrate levels. Um, so it would be a good idea to get your well tested if you rely on a domestic well in that particular area. OK, so let's pull up another one. OK, here we are again. So um, we are again outside of here's a, a public water system. Um, this public water system is the Bronco Winery public water system. But that location was outside of it. And so also in a red area, which would be a concern. And you should consider getting your well tested for nitrate levels. Um, yes, yes, I will put that that link in the chat. Let me do the last um, example here that somebody provided an address for. OK. So here we are in Oakdale. And we are, again, we're outside of a public water system. So this address is likely pulling their drinking water from a domestic well. They are in an orange zone, which is good because that's probably indicates um, that nitrate levels um, are not above the safe drinking water limit. So, but it's getting close, right? So um, green and yellow means low, um, orange and red are a little bit higher. So this, you know, just to be sure, you should definitely have your well tested to make sure because there's variability. Um, as you can see in these maps, it can change very drastically from one area to another. Um, so it would be good to get your well tested to be sure. So, okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll jump back to the um, presentation. I appreciate you guys participating. Thank you. Let me get back to the... Okay. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. So um, Besides being a useful tool that can empower you and educate you, the public, about conditions and areas you care about, um, this map can also be used to estimate the number of domestic wells and the population of people that might live in areas impacted by high nitrate. Um, the map on the right should look familiar by now, um, only this one shows um, <clears throat> the uh, domestic wells located as well. Um, and these domestic wells are estimated locations based on Department of Water Resources data. And we have only plotted domestic wells located outside of known public water system boundaries. And the idea here is that if you are within that public water system boundary, you are probably not drinking water from a domestic well. So <clears throat> um, the table on the bottom shows you a summary of the information from this analysis. and shows you that there are over 350 domestic wells located outside of the public water systems that potentially have an estimated nitrate level above the safe drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen in the Modesto subbasin and a total of 1700 in Turlock. So that means that there are potentially over 2000 homes that rely on water that might be unsafe to drink. Um, to further discover how many people might be affected, we can use 2010 census block mapping data. This is a GIS coverage that's available from the um, Census Bureau, the federal government, and we can estimate the population of people living in those red areas on the map. So the table shows you that in the Modesto management zone, there are over 4,500 people estimated to live outside of known public water system boundaries and in the red areas where groundwater may be impacted by nitrate. And in the Turlock management zone, that number jumps up to about 37,400 people. Um, so that makes a total of almost 42,000 people in the management zones that may be affected by nitrate above the safe drinking water standard. So now that we're armed with all of this information about where the nitrate problems are focused and the potential scale of the issue, <laughs> we need to find some solutions. Um, so I think Richard is gonna talk about that next. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Barb. 
All right, so we, a little while ago, we talked about documents that have been posted for review. A lot of the information that Barb just gave you in terms of the maps and the figures and the basis for those are in those documents. So you can go back and review those if you'd like. The link itself is not in there. Uh, this is new information that's been pulled together so we could share it with you today in this, in this meeting. But uh, I think with the maps and the, and the documentation, it'll help give you a better understanding of, the, again, the magnitude of the issue in these areas. Well, part of the management zone's purpose is not just to document, it's to actually come up with solutions. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a deliverable that's part of the management zone called the Early Action Plan. And it's named that for a very simple reason. It describes the early actions that are to be conducted by each management zone uh, to start addressing uh, those uh, wells that are found to have nitrate that exceeds uh, the safe levels. So next slide. So I'm gonna do in these next few slides is kind of give you an overview of what's in the early action plan. This is a draft and uh, again, out for public review. And we would encourage anyone to take a look at it and give us your feedback in terms of what we describe as the proposed early actions. So I think we've talked enough now, you hopefully have a good understanding. The purpose of this plan is to provide access to safe drinking water for those dependent on groundwater from wells that are found to exceed the nitrate safe drinking water standard. We continue to show the color coding here, just to illustrate again, when we say unsafe, we're talking about above 10 milligrams per liter. That's a federal regulation, as a state regulation. It's used across the United States as the level of which you go from being safe to unsafe. Um, the early action plan talks about what are short-term temporary solutions rec and recognize that the management zone over time will be developing long-term permanent solutions so that you're not in some iterative process where you keep having to find out as you're well safe for nitrate. The intent is to solve the problem in the long term. Next slide. So what options are proposed to be available in, in the early action plan? Uh, first, we have two household options tailored to each resident's specific needs. So these, these are household specific, determined by the resident working with the management zone. And these two are on the left. One is home bottled water delivery. The second is installing a point of use treatment system in your home. A third option may become available if there's sufficient community interest. And this is a general community wide option. It's not home specific. It is where you set up fill stations at uh, targeted locations where people drive up, bring their own containers, and can fill the bottles of water for free. Any of these solutions, let's say right now, we'll say again, probably more than once, are we provided to the community at no cost. So your participation in this program is, is free for you. The, the need is for you to interact with the management zone to determine whether you have a concern and do you need an alternative source of water. Next slide. So how can you receive bottled water or have a point of use treatment, treatment system installed? Well, first of all, the resident needs to coordinate with the management zone. We'll talk about coordination in an upcoming uh, slide, but there, there'll be different ways to do that. And we, would, we will work with you to determine the best option. Services will be provided for you if you can answer yes to these three statements. First, is your home located in the Modesto or Turlock management zone? The map that Barb just uh, gave examples from, we had three uh, addresses put in. Of course, all of you are within this area. And so we can quickly check uh, to make sure you're, you're actually resident in these management zones. Second, because the management zone will be providing the services, they will have vendors or service providers who that will come to your home to provide the services being requested, whether it be bottled water or point of view system. You, if they require some agreement for you to have those services from them, you will need to sign an agreement with that provider. But the management zone first will work with the vendors to make sure that the documentation and the requirements are as simple as possible for the homeowner. Last and the most important element of these three criteria is your well actually does have unsafe nitrate levels greater than 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen. So you need to be able to say yes to all three of these statements. The first two are probably fairly simple to answer. The last one is, is the one that requires additional work. So next slide. So how do you know? Now we have a, a stipulation in the early action plan. If you have well data that already shows that it's greater than 10, and it's from a certified laboratory, then we the information 
is, that is needed by the management zone is available already. But we suspect most homeowners or renters will not have information regarding the nitrate levels in their well. So the management zone will work with you to schedule a time for a sampler uh, to come to your home and test your well water for you, again, at no cost to the homeowner. The results will be provided to the resident or the homeowner, and the next steps will depend on the result of that analysis. And the arrow points to, again, our familiar uh, color coding, but the outcome depends on where, what kind of sample result do you get. As we've indicated, if it's greater than 10, it's unsafe. And so immediately you will be moved into uh, a process to make sure you get an alternative water source. Your choices, as we said, are bottled water delivery to your home or a point of use system for installation. And we will work with you to figure out what's best for your home. If the fill stations are available, that and there's enough community interest to install those, that's an alternative as well. If, if you as a homeowner are, are satisfied knowing that your well is unsafe, but you'd rather go get water on your own at a fill station, you can do that as well, as long as those uh, systems are available to you. But what about those situations where your, your test result comes back, the nitrate levels are pretty high, and by high we're defining as greater than eight milligrams per liter, one of the addresses we looked at a moment ago is in an orange area, so it, it may very well have nitrate levels greater than eight. Maybe it's 9.8 and it's getting close to those unsafe levels. There is a stipulation in the early action plan to continue to work with you and provide opportunities for follow-up sampling. We don't know if the water quality is staying the same. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Groundwater quality does change over time, usually very slowly but it does change. And so we would wanna work with you to uh, check again in the future to see, do you need an alternative source of water? If it's down on the low to moderate levels, green to yellow, uh, you're, you're actually in pretty good shape. You have a uh, relatively good water, at least for nitrate. So the last bullet on this slide on the left is it's known throughout the Central Valley of California that in some places there are other contaminants, we call them co-contaminants sometimes, that are also present. And so the management zone will be, is looking for opportunities to work with other entities to test for those constituents as well. The early action plan management zone is focused on nitrate, but we do recognize the need to work with other organizations that are out there testing for other contaminants to make sure that you don't have other issues out there that you're unaware of. Next slide. As I mentioned, water fill stations, this is a community-wide approach uh, as a way to provide alternative water. There are people who do not want home water delivery. They may not want someone to come in and install a point of view system in their home and recognize that system does need to be maintained. So there would have to be periodic visits from the vendor to check to be sure it's still treating water as it's supposed to. Uh, some are more comfortable going to a location that's common to everybody. And we will work with the community to decide, do you want these uh, systems provided by the management zone in either the Modesto or the Turlock management zone? That process will occur over the, the, the coming year to decide what, what are the best opportunities for this type of an approach. If they are installed, they again will be done at no cost to the community. Anyone will be able to drive up at any time, 24 seven, bring your bottle, Usually they hold anything from a one, three or five gallon type bottle and fill up as many as you need to at the time and take them home. And you can do that as, as often as you need to. Next slide. So how do you connect with the management zones? We're giving you a lot of information. We're telling you about documents, but in the end it requires communication directly with the management zone. So if you do need your well tested, you, you can do that or you need more information about the program or I want to understand, are there fill stations in my area? All of these types of communications can happen in different ways. So we highlighted the three basic approaches that we will be implementing. One on the left is what we call targeted outreach to residents. As Barb has shown, and we have these so-called red areas that are definitely areas that we're most concerned about or most likely to have nitrate that is unsafe. Uh, we will have a portion of our outreach will be directed to those areas. Uh, our, our goal is to identify the residents who are not served by a public water system and, and actually send them information in the mail so they actually know about the program and we encourage them to contact 
the Valley Water Collaborative. We will continue to have regular community-wide meetings such as this. We do hope that someday we can actually meet in person and sit in a room like uh, you can see there. And uh, But if not, these virtual meetings will continue, but we will do them periodically. So again, we're trying to get to you the information that you need. But on the right, always recognize you can contact the Valley Water Collaborative at any time. You do not need an invitation to do that. And Perry's going to talk in a moment about how to best do that. And so uh, you're also you're free. You don't have to wait for a community outreach event. You can you can do that on your own. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it back to Perry to wrap up and talk about uh, how to get more information. Okay, great. Thank you, Richard. So before I give some of the closing uh, contact information sources and such, any questions, uh, you have a raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. You can ask questions or think about them as we uh, wrap up here. And you can go to the next slide. So here's how to comment. You can send an email to the EAP comments at valleywaterc.org and Valley Water C, we, we didn't want to get people to have to spell collab, uh, collaborator, <laughs> collaboration. So we uh, just went with the C. So uh, valleywaterc.org, you can either that or you can call me at the number you see here. And then there's a feedback form. If you follow this website, uh, you can find it also on our uh, valleywaterc.org uh, that has a, a brief questionnaire we'd like to have you fill out. It's anonymous but it can give us some pretty quick turnaround on uh, hearing what folks are thinking about, about this plan. And then some of the next slides, some of the critical upcoming dates is uh, we have another outreach meeting tomorrow from six to seven to capture the folks that have to be at a job during the day. So we'll have opportunity for more uh, public comments then. We have our plan due to the water board on May, March 8th. So this, uh, the comment period that we have here is, uh, it was in that previous slide on February 22nd. We'd like to have all public comments so we can get them into our report that's due to the regional board on the 8th. And then as of now, the plan is to get our implementation activity started uh, early May, unless the board, regional water board indicates that there is, uh, that the early action plan has some uh, deficiencies that need to be corrected. So the next slide, if you want to get more information on the nitrate control program, the CB Salinity Coalition, it's a uh, nonprofit forum to help on the salt and nitrate control programs. You can go to that website and find uh, as much information as you could possibly want. Uh, Valleywater.c again, my email address, uh, any of these sources can provide you information. And the links to get in touch with us if you uh, want more clarification on any of the things that you've heard today or as this program uh, goes into the future. So I will open it up for questions now. If you want to move to the, well, you can leave this slide up. Well, either one of them has a contact info. Uh, Perry Umar has a, has a question. Hi, um, thank you again for this um, excellent presentation. And Barbara, thank you for the, for the interactive map. So my address was one of those addresses that uh, demonstrated that I am in, a, you know, in an area that may uh, actually be receiving high levels of nitrate. But I guess my question is, I was looking at that map and um, where I live is primarily mostly, uh, you know, kind of a planned community. So there's a multiple number of, maybe close to 100, 200 houses that are, uh, you know, built by these sort of, you know, what are housing development corporations. So how are you defining domestic well then? Are you defining a domestic well as a well connected to a single house? Or is it something where some of these larger, you know, housing complexes are connected to a well or, or and not connected to, you know, the Turlock Irrigation District? Hey, um, thanks, Umar. That's a great question. So the... Um the public water systems don't always show up. Um, this GIS layer is available um, through the state, um, but it doesn't necessarily contain everything. So it won't contain 
uh, the coverage for these smaller water systems that it sounds like you're describing. So um, if your property doesn't get its well or water from a domestic well that's like in your backyard, um, then you should be able to contact the either the homeowners group or whoever um, the community that would have access to the water quality. So there's something called a consumer confidence report that um, I think if there's a certain number of connections for this water system, they would need to provide that to you. So you can request that from your community. Um, if it's not showing up on this particular map, that's just because the state doesn't have a mappable boundary for it. Um, so yeah, so I would, I would recommend finding out where you get your water from first. And, and Barb, if I would add to that, in the early action plan, there are numerous tables uh, in the appendices that list out all the known drinking water systems. They may not map well, is that correct, Barbara? They may not map well, but they are known systems. And That's correct. So, right. So you may find your system actually on there. We had in a chat a note about mobile home parks. Uh, no doubt those are in there as well because there are a lot of them out there. One of the things that's going to have to happen through the early action plan, in, and it's one of the early tasks, is to understand better who is on a well and who is not. And there's a task that happens. Uh, I shouldn't say that way, who is on a, a system, a public system, and who is on an individual domestic well in their backyard. And that'll be a process uh, to work through that. You, you'd like to think in 2021, uh, all that information is well known, but it's not. The reason yeah, I one, one thing I would add to that as well is if you get a water bill, it's, you're likely on a small system or a public water system. If you're on a domestic well, your only bill is going to come from in my area, PG&E, and maybe another energy provider, but you get you get the electric bill, yeah. not a water bill if you have a domestic well. Okay, no, because the reason I ask is also, another reason I ask, I mean, is because uh, the numbers that were given about the number of potential Turlock residents at risk of high water, uh, you know, higher levels of nitrate, uh, that number was actually literally half of Turlock's population. So, uh, because Turlock is at, I think last census was at 72. If we add a couple more thousand to that, uh, I think the number that was given was 37. So that means every other person in Turlock technically has bad drinking water. So maybe there is some sort of wetting process that needs to happen for us to figure out, you know, um, how, whether that is the case, or whether that isn't the case, I guess. Well, one thing on that, and Richard could elaborate and Barbara is, that's the Turlock Basin. So that is not just Turlock proper. That's going to be the basin that DWR designated from San Joaquin River to more or less the base of the Sierra Nevadas. And then on the south, it's the Merced River, and to the north, Tuolumne River. So that's Turlock Basin. Same way with Modesto. Modesto Basin is, again, rivers to rivers. And it includes areas beyond the city limits. Oh, OK. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, sorry. I, I saw that I was unmuted, so I figured I might as well talk. But yeah, I think the city of Turlock is probably on its city water system. So we're talking about all the unincorporated areas around right. Turlock. But that is obviously still a, a lot of uh, people. Uh, you mentioned doing like mailers, um, I'm kind of curious um, you know, what, uh, out of that big number of, of people, how, uh, you know, are you able to, um, to make contacts with, with the majority of those people? And what, you know, are there certain communities where it's harder to get a response or maybe there's, you know, language barriers or you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, work hours for a lot of people. So I'm curious how, how that's going and, um, you know, what, um, what else can be done? I know I, I'm Tom from Valley Improvement Projects and we had you, you participate in a little uh, online webinar that we did to try to get the word out about this as well. So um, if there's, you know, any way we can help get the word out um, to more, more community members, um, you know, we'd be, we'd be glad to help uh, in, in any way that we have the capacity to. Yeah, Thomas, I think, thanks for joining again. And absolutely when this, 
when the program rolls out, and now we're looking for comments, and you, certainly the general public is wel welcome to make comments. When the program actually rolls out, we're going to do definitely media saturation. We're going to be doing mailings, road signs, public service announcements, uh, social media, and the, the targeted areas for the mailings will be sim similar to what you saw on the maps. You, you take, you get these, you can buy these mailing lists of all the streets in, a, in this basin, and then we'll take out the cities and the remaining addresses we'll assume will be in a, uh, not in a public water system. But if we do get applicants from a public water system, we would check into that. And, and as uh, it was mentioned earlier by Barbara, we're going to do our best to find out these smaller systems. Somebody mentioned trailer parks too, because that, that's a public water system. It may only serve four or five or 10 residents, but it's a public water system. And we, any of those that are registered, we have listed in this plan, uh, as Richard described. But yeah, we'll be reaching out to Thomas and working with with uh, CSU Stanislaw and any others that we can help get this word out about the availability of this uh, clean water. Uh, Perry, Joe Rendon has his hand up. Joe, did you wanna ask your question? Hi, yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I have my Zoom uh, account on my colleague's uh, name. This is actually Catherine Robinson. I'm from California Rural Legal Assistance, so excuse Joe. Um, uh, I, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much as well for the um, e extensive, comprehensive um, plans. Uh, I've been going through them uh, little by little here and just wanted to follow up um, particularly uh, with regards to um, the process of uh, uh, implementing the point of view systems and uh, or the, the bottle um, delivery systems. Um, I understand that for the point of view system that there, if, if you're dealing with um, tenants, that that tenant will need to get the permission of the landlord in order to have the point of um, use system uh, installed, if that's correct. And then um, is that, and then just real quickly, uh, that's not the case with the, the bottle delivery system. Is that right? They don't need the landlord's approval? That, that is correct in both cases. And the, re the reason we included the, the land landowner, homeowner, or landlord uh, approval on a point of use because it will require a modification of the plumbing system. And uh, just for you know liability reasons, safety reasons, it's best that, that that person be advised that someone's asking to have that modified in their home. But they would still be able to have bottled water if a landlord is difficult for any reason, doesn't want to do that, bottled water still will be provided. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you as well for clarifying that it, you're right that it's not always the landlord that's technically the owner. And so it can start to get complicated. And so okay. my yes. follow-up question is, um, is there a process uh, of potentially um, reaching out um, on the um, collaborative side um, to to the actual owner of the of the property about this because sometimes certainly with a lot of the clients that we work with at CRLA um, in landlord tenant issues there's no way that the tenants are going to reach out to their their landlords or or even know who the property owner is or have their contact information um, so I can see that being a real barrier and I'm just curious whether that's been considered. Yeah, one of the, the ways that we're going to roll out this, this outreach is in priorities and in phases. And the first is going to be as many places, as many contacts as we can put out. What you described, we've done in other regions, and we go to the county and get the, the landowner names. And we have not checked with Stanislaw County yet. That's a primary county that we're going to be covering. Some, are, some of them are said county, but if we can get a mailing list of the landowners in these areas, we would certainly want to do a, a outreach to them as well. But I'm, I, I don't think we would do that the first 30 or 60 days, maybe subsequent to that. But yeah, that's a good point too. Thank you. And, and Catherine, are you going to be submitting uh, written comments of this type? Yes, we're planning on, on submitting okay. comments. Well, I, I appreciate that comment about uh, renters and like not knowing even who their landlord is that that's a useful comment to think about great 
Yeah, and we'll be reaching out to you also uh, to get support and help from CRLA as we as we roll this effort out. Yeah, absolutely. We're a available to help in any way that we can. Thank you. And I didn't mention, but I think it was in, implicit is everything we, we do is going to be bilingual. We'll have English and Spanish brochures and postcards, everything that goes out. We'll do one side English, the other side Spanish. So we make sure to cover that. And we're still looking into whether there's a third language we may need to do some translation with. But again, priority is to start with English and Spanish speaking folks. Perry, there's a there's a comment in the chat from Belinda um, that was posted a few moments ago. It says, are there community wells in these areas? I would think so. I don't know, Valinda, if you felt like that was addressed in the conversation. Yeah, community wells are often referred to as the smalls, the state, small public water systems. So those are those again are the ones that are a little harder to map, especially private um, system. But anyone that's that's uh, regulated by the county or the state will be uh, become part of our list, right, Richard? I mean that's what you've been including in the plan so far. Yes. Is the, yes. All those systems. Yes, it will be included. Um, One thing that we have done in the other program that I'm involved with is that when we find out that there's a system that someone is on that is not on our mapping, that gives us a good indication that they have neighbors and others on that connection that we contact. And we usually use it as a, a reference, uh, ask the people that we contacted, find out it's a new small system, is, you know, give us, ask the information to your neighbors or give us the information about them and we'll reach out to them. Lydia, did you have another? No, Paul, uh, Perry, no, there, there are no other uh, questions and no other hands raised at this time. As to what it will cost to, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, oh, Belinda, you, you um, you muted yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry. There was just someone else in the room no, speaking. No, no. Um, too many people working from home. Um, I just had, I guess, a question like for what, today or? people on a community system. Would you be looking at individual, you know, homes within, say, a subdivision that was on a community well um, having an option individually as homes or would and is there a possibility that there will be like community fill stations along with um, point of service usage either delivery of water or a system at the home well again we're going to be phasing this and i'll have richard add to the end we're going to be phasing this so the first option that we're going to provide that's easy to get rolling is a bottle of water so we can do that quickly uh, the point of use is a little bit more complexity to that because of the there's a lot of other elements in this in the water that have to be considered the well pressure other things so the, if it fits the need a pou would be good and then the fill stations we really want to get the feedback from the community on where those would be best placed other parts of the state, there is no interest in fill stations, but in, in other parts, there is interest. So we really want to make sure before we make that investment that people are going to use those fill stations. So we, we expect that those would, uh, if, if we get favorable feedback, we would be starting on that late this year to identify those locations and with the hope of getting an installation by early next year. Now, I, Thank you. I think your question, Belinda, about you know, single homeowner within a community water system. I mean, the intent is to work, if there's a community water system that's not in compliance for nitrate, let's start with that. Then the intent would be to work with the system to resolve the problem. So all the homes have, have that addressed versus working with an individual home. Um, I don't think we've thought through or carried through the process of what if the community water system can't resolve it, would we then 
do it home by home, we probably would have to because that we'd still have to be looking at a replacement water situation. But if someone, but, but if a bunch of homes are connected to one system, ideally we solve the system first. I agree. That makes the greater sense, you know, to solve the problem for a number of, of residences rather than individually. I think probably, and potentially more cost effective. I don't know how that will eventually work out. It, it probably will be. I think it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to find all kinds of permutations of problems that have to be yeah. uh, figured out the solutions. Yes, it'll be an undertaking for sure. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, appreciate you taking your time from this, from your busy day to join us. If you have others that you think might be interested in hearing uh, this, this repeated tomorrow again at six o'clock, we'll, we'll be going over the same presentation and welcome any particip participants that are interested. So thank, thank you again, everybody.